Matt Bailey, I'm with the DLR group. Uh, just to give you a, a quick, I guess, bio of myself, I've been working with school districts in Nebraska and around the Midwest for 34 years now. Uh, most recently in Creek with their new high school, not too long ago in Norris with their new up there, uh, new middle or intermediate school, as well as a lot of the storm damage work that was done there. We also worked in, uh, do work in Seward and, and uh, Gretna, Elkhorn, and many of the, the, I guess what I would call your peer districts around the state. Um, and again, I wanted to just start off with the fact that um, the idea of, of addressing your elementary needs is not a new thing. This is something that the district has been talking about, studying, considering for a long time. Uh, and so we've been brought to the table now as the Strategic Planning Committee here several years ago made a recommendation to move towards a central elementary school. Um, and so part of our challenge as a consultant to the school district is to um, gather all the data and information that's going to be needed for your community to make a decision as to whether that's the direction that they want to go. So the number one question that we have to answer is why can't we just fix what we have? You've probably heard that, you've probably thought that yourself. And so what I want to do today is just give you a very quick overview of, of kind of how we're going about to, to answer that question and then other questions, as Dr. Nareth mentioned, um, that you may have. And if, if we're not answering all those questions, we want to know what they are so that as we go forward that we can inform the, the, the patrons of your school district as to what the need is, what the solutions are, and then they can, they can tell us what the right answer is. This isn't about what I want. This isn't about what Dr. Narathron wants. It's not about what the school board wants necessarily. It's about what the patrons of your community want. And so that's really what our task is, that my job is to help facilitate that process with your community, to take <coughs> the needs of your elementary school and try to come up with some reasonable solutions to solve those. So, um, it's just kind of a quick overview of what I want to talk about today. Uh, just want to share a little bit about the facility audit process and, and how we're going to uh, attack that. Um, and then share some of the findings from that audit that we've completed. We started doing this back in uh, November. Uh, and so we've got about three months of, of data collection and, and just discussions that we've had with many of you, uh, elementary staff that are here. You may have met with me or with Vanessa or others from our company uh, as we talked about the needs of your particular elementary building. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Um, there's three components when we talk about a facility. Number one, what's your enrollment? How many kids are you serving? And how, how much space do you have to serve them in? So enrollment and capacity are really important when we talk about facilities. The second part is then physical plant needs, in other words, just the, the bricks and mortar and HVAC systems, electrical systems, data systems, roofs, doors, windows, all the things that are kind of boring and mundane but are necessary to have a functional elementary school, okay? And then the third part is, is what you guys all deal with every day, and that's educational programs. In other words, what are you teaching, how are you teaching it, and how does the space that you're teaching it in affect your ability to deliver those programs effectively, okay? So that, those are really the three pieces, the three prongs of what we're looking at as we assess your elementary facilities. And then once we have all that information, then we can start developing the different options. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the options that we've considered and then kind of what, might, what some of those might look like going forward. Uh, and then talk a little bit about just the cost and how we come about with determining what the costs are of these different options. And, uh, and then just kind of where do we go from here. Uh, obviously, there's still a lot of work to do, so uh, I'm going to get right into it here. Um, the first thing we deal with is, is, is enrollment. And you can see, I know these numbers aren't huge, but uh, you can see each elementary building uh, we have a capacity. So, in your elementary school, we have a capacity of 160 students. Right
right now there are 159 students as of last week. And we know that those numbers change almost on a daily basis. But uh, as of last week, that building is in essence 99% full. Okay. Lincoln Elementary School has a capacity of 240, 244 students in that building last week. Paddock Lane, 260 uh, capacity with a Enrollment of 270, so obviously it's over capacity. Uh, and uh, by evidence of the portable classrooms that you have at that building. And then Stoddard Elementary is a uh, 140 student capacity and 143 students currently. So you can see just by looking at these numbers that you are at or over capacity in all four of your elementary schools. So as we start to look at the space needs to serve those students, and as we look at some of the spaces that aren't really functioning as they need to, you'll, you can see very quickly that there are some needs for additional space really in all four of your elementary schools. The other point I would make is, is that right now you do have a preschool program at Paddock Lane and at Cedar. Um, the intent is to be able to offer that preschool programs throughout the district. In fact, the, the, the district is currently in the process of renting some space at Southeast Community College add another preschool program for next, next year. So uh, again, trying to respond to the program needs of your community is really important. You know, we need to understand what those needs are. This is just a graph that shows kind of historical data. The pink line in here is the capacity of your existing four elementary schools. And you can see going back to 2000, kind of what the enrollment has been. So you can see it's been a pretty consistent number over the years, at least over the last uh, 16 years. Um, and so, but we're starting to get up to where, uh, again, the, that overcapacity is becoming a, a difficulty in terms of, the, again, you look at adding more preschool programs and other special programs, uh, there just isn't enough space to serve your students. Um, this is the, uh, Cedar Elementary School, and I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, but I'll just note that that building is about 24,000 square feet. It sits on about a nine-acre site. And uh, the other thing I would tell you is that all four of these buildings were built within a year of each other. So there are a lot of the same problems that exist, say, in Cedar, also exist in the other three elementary schools. Lincoln Elementary School is about a 30,000 square foot building and it sits on about an 8 acre site. Uh, Paddock Lane uh, has a little bit bigger site, about 9.5 acres, but again, keep in mind this building also has all the alternative curriculum programs housed in it. Uh, we have the preschool building out, it's a separate building, and we also have the two portable classrooms to the north there. So. Again, um, kind of make do with the space that is there right now. And then uh, Stoddard Elementary School, which is a very small site, about 4.8 acres, and it's about 31,000 square feet. So when you add it all up, you have about 128,000 square feet of elementary school building, okay, or build, buildings in your school district. So part of what we do then is we look at those buildings and say, okay, uh, what are the physical plant needs? We, we brought in a team and looked at, uh, at things like the mechanical system, the electrical systems, uh, the roofs, the, the doors, the walls, all the different components, again, of the physical plant needs of the buildings. And you can see, you know, there's a need to replace parking lots. Right now, in most cases, you're having your parent drop off and pick up is right on the street adjacent to the school, which creates obvious traffic flow issues, uh, and, and so we want to try to resolve that. Um, just the envelope of the building, there's some needs, sorry, there's some needs in terms of updating some windows and doors, uh, masonry and uh, tuck pointing. Uh, there's still a lot of vinyl asbestos tile on the floor that needs to be removed and replaced. Um, just general classroom remodeling. Uh, bathroom remodeling. Um, the biggest issues in those existing buildings are relative to the mechanical and electrical systems. And part of
part of the challenge is because of the way those buildings were built, the, the ceiling that you see in those buildings is actually the roof structure. There is no space above the ceiling to, to put ductwork. Right now, all the ductwork runs in tunnels underneath the floor. Uh, and, and so there's not a lot of uh, space there to, to make new improvements relative to the mechanical system. So replacing and updating the HVAC system to provide adequate outside air and ventilation is, is, is really, a, a really one of the biggest issues relative to all four of the elementary schools. Um, updating plumbing fixtures, uh, electrical upgrades, and you know, one of the big complaints we heard from teachers is just not enough outlets in the classroom to support the technology, and so again, providing upgrades that would allow for that. <coughs> And then replacing telephone systems, intercom systems, fire alarms, all those kinds of things that, that, that are just required to have a functional building. So those are kind of the, a summary of the physical plant needs. And again, because all four buildings were built at about the same time, there's a lot of the same problems in all four buildings. So there are some nuances in each building that I'm not going to go through with you today. We have a very detailed uh, renovation summary, which I'll show you an example of here one of those that, that we've documented all that information on. Um, the other part of, of the audit is the program related, and this is where you, the teachers, really came into play in terms of helping us determine what are some of the space needs that exist within the existing elementary school. So one of the biggest challenges is just where the offices is located relative to the main entrance to the building and having adequate space to accommodate office staff, principal, people coming in to visit, other itinerant staff that are coming traveling between buildings, and having a secure uh, control point at the entrance to the building is really a big issue in all four buildings. Um, obviously, because of your four buildings, you have a lot of staff that are shared between buildings, and so you have traveling staff, obviously, that provides for some, this inefficiency in terms of time, and also you have even administrators that are, are traveling. So there's days where you don't have a principal that is in a particular building. And that's a concern, and that's an issue that we want to try to address. Excuse me. Um, lack of conferencing and testing space in the building is also something huge, as you know, with the additional testing requirements that the state has imposed uh, and required. Having places where you can test kids and then do some follow-up testing. These buildings were designed at a time when you just didn't have those kinds of requirements. And so they're, you're using every little bit of cranny and closet that you can find to accommodate some of those programs. Uh, we talked about the preschool and, and wanting to be able to have preschool in, in all four buildings. So that's something that we want to try to accommodate. Uh, we believe that the portable classrooms and Paddock are not acceptable from a security and, and just quality of education. They're much smaller classrooms than your typical classrooms. They're only about 600 square feet. So they really don't, they aren't appropriate. So we, we would propose to replace those with permanent classroom space. Um, and just additional classroom space in general. Again, we saw the numbers um, and, and trying to accommodate the required classroom space just for the students that you currently have in your system. Um, as we talked to staff, one of the big issues too was because of the, the, the four separate buildings, there's not a lot of time for outside of your PLC time like you have today for grade level teachers to be able to get together and collaborate and talk about, again, things that are working, things that aren't working. Um, and, and so being able to have that grade level teaming in a central building would be much more advantageous than being spread out throughout uh, four separate buildings. Um, kind of talked about poor ventilation in the, under the physical plant summary, but we believe it also has an impact on education because when we talk about indoor air quality, what we're really talking about is, is bringing fresh air into the classroom and, and keeping the, the CO2 levels at a low enough level where kids aren't losing that attention span so that they have a sharp, sharp mind and, and able to, to listen and pay attention while they're in the classroom. Uh, cabinetry storage is another big issue that we heard a lot throughout the buildings. Um, uh, special 
my staff, again, is share physical education, music, media center. Because of the four buildings, those people have to be shared between all four buildings. And then just the core facilities, it's kind of running off the bottom there. But, um, one of the biggest issues, too, is in all four buildings, we have a, a multi-purpose room that functions both as a cafeteria and as a gymnasium. And it just it really restricts the amount of time that you could have dedicated to physical education because you have to have time for breakfast in the morning, have to have set up time for lunch, got to have lunch, and then also when you get in the time of the year like now when it's cold out and it's too cold for students to go outside for recess, there's no place for indoor recess. And so having a separate cafeteria from the gymnasium is something that we really felt that we heard pretty widespread in all four buildings. As far as the the, the new building requirements and what we want to try to do as we look at both renovation options and the new building option is have an equal uh, means of measurement. And so we want to try to <coughs> develop a pro program requirements that would match both the renovation option and the new building option. So some of those program requirements, obviously we want to be able to house preschool through fifth grade in all, build in all scenarios. We have to average, house an average of 143 students per grade, which is about 1,000 students total at the moment. Uh, you can see kind of the grade, what the, what the size classes would be per grade level. And again, that's not a perfect science because kids don't show up in perfect numbers. They, whoever, when they show up, they are within whatever grade they're in. Uh, but we want to try to, to stay within these guidelines in terms of class size. One of the unique things about Beatrice is you have an extraordinarily uh, large and strong alternative curriculum program. You serve a lot of students, and that takes off a lot of space. And so we need to make sure we have adequate space to accommodate those programs. Um, I already kind of mentioned the dedicated cafeteria separated from the gym. And then we also want to be able to be able to anticipate growth in the future. So all of the different options, you want to make sure we meet this criteria that we've established. Now, part of what we've done as a, as a team, we've had uh, Dr. Nareth and, and John and the principals and Jackie and, and our partners from uh, Samson and Casper's uh, Construction have been meeting every week. And, and one of the things we did is we toured uh, some elementary schools that would be comparable to what we're proposing for Beatrice. And I know one of the biggest concerns that we hear about, oh my gosh, a thousand students in elementary school. Well, the, what we need to do is we want to find ways to make that what seems to be a very large school not seem so large to that student as they come to that building. So I want to share with you a little bit about how we can do that and accommodate that and can still be able to take advantage of the, some of the advantages of, of having a central location in terms of the, the collaboration and the sharing and the efficient use of staff. So we did, we visited a, a elementary school in Eudora, Kansas, uh, which is, the building's about six years old, and then we visited a, a, an elementary school in Oskaloosa, Iowa. So it was very helpful to be able to see and talk to the staff there and talk to the principal and understand how they make it work in a building of a thousand students, and it was very Lightning to see that it can it can work and it can work very well. Um, and so there were some things that we really liked, particularly at the Eudora building when they had grade level team pods or team team I guess neighborhoods if you will, where you can have that collaboration of teachers that are in the same grade level and have students together within that grade level uh, house or pod. Um, all the classrooms with natural light, which you're fortunate right now, for the most part, you have that in most of your elementary buildings now. Uh, but that we feel that's really important for a quality educational space is having natural light. Um, having the activity areas separated from the academic areas. So, you know, as you know, uh, your schools get used a lot more than just from 8 o'clock in the morning till 4 o'clock in the afternoon. There's a lot of community use. And so wanting to be able to have people in the building without having them in the whole building was 
something that they really liked that we saw at, at the Oskaloosa building. And then having separate parent drop off, separate from bus drop off and pick up. So from a safety standpoint, just a traffic flow, being able to have those separate areas. Um, so what are the, what are the options? Um, the first option that I would say is not really a good option is you could do nothing. You could just say, you know what, we're just going to keep going and, and, and keep dealing with the issues that we have. And I, th I, I think I'd say for me to speak for the board to say that's not a viable option. They, they, I think most people would agree that we've got to do something. So, but it is an option. Bond issue doesn't pass, that's going to be where you're at. Um, so so the, the next option would be what I'd call the base option, which would basically be just to fix what you have, but not fix the program problems you have. So basically just renovating the existing buildings to bring them up to speed in terms of the physical plan issues that we identified, but not dealing with the programmatic issues that we identified. Does that make sense? So that's option I guess what I'm calling the base option here. So it's basically just maintaining and updating your buildings. But option one then would be to renovate and then add the additional space that we need to meet those program needs that we identified in each of the buildings. So that would be option one. <clears throat> option two then would be to build a new K through five building <coughs> and then use one of the existing elementary schools and renovate it into your kind of a central preschool building. And as we talked about, Lincoln Elementary School seemed to be probably the best location, and best site to accommodate that, although there are probably a couple other buildings that could work, but um, for the purposes of this study, we've used Lincoln Elementary School as the that's preschool location for option two. And then, of course, the third option would be the, the, what was the recommendation of the strategic planning group was a new central pre-K through 5 elementary school on the property that's just right across the street here. <coughs> so what we've done, and again, this is just an example of the program <coughs> summary that we looked at for all four buildings. So you can see here under the existing column, we've documented all the program spaces for, so for example, here's the principal's office, um, or, you know, here's preschool, so we've got a preschool classroom here. Um, so this is the existing spaces that you have available, and then here is what we're saying that we need to meet the program needs that we've identified. So we compare the existing to the desired, and then we have either a net surplus or a net efficiency as you look at the column over here on the far right hand side. And I'm just going to go to the next page to give you a little better example of this for, for purposes of illustration. Here's the food service. Right now um, what we're saying is that the existing gymnasium cafeteria is really more of a gym than it is a cafeteria. So we're saying we don't really have a cafeteria but we need one. So we, we have a deficiency of 2,400 square feet. We also really don't have any place to serve the food right now in the elementary school. The ovens, the, the kitchen is in a closet in the gym. That's the, the serving area for the, kit, for the, for the lunch program. Um, so what we're saying is we're going to add a new cafeteria and a new serving area to meet that need because we're we're saying that the existing gym is going to be the gym, okay? So again, I'm not going to go through line by line. Basically, when we get to the end of the page here, it gives us a summary of all the needs. So the, you can see here the existing elementary school at Paddock Lane is 33,676 square feet. We're saying we need 59,873 to meet all the program requirements. Now, I want to point out, this number right here does not include the existing portables, and it does not include the metal building where alternative curriculum is offered, because we've determined as we've assessed those buildings that those spaces are not adequate. There's storm damage to the, to the uh, alternative program metal building, and that building just needs to be replaced. And again, as I mentioned before, the portable classroom we just didn't feel were appropriate for long-term program space. So, those are not 
not excluded in this number here. So you can see, just to meet the program needs at Paddock Lane Elementary School, we're looking at about a 26,000 square foot addition, in addition to the remaining building, the minus the metal building and, and the, the portable classrooms at Paddock. So we've done the same exercise in all four buildings. Okay. Uh, I mentioned the tours of, of the two buildings. I, I won't go through this. We've kind of touched on this already, but I've got some slides to show you. This is the Eudora plan, uh, the site plan. Um, the thing that's unique about this building is it, it has these gray level houses that you can kind of see from this aerial photograph. So in, when this building was designed, it was designed as a K-5 building, or sorry, grades one through five. So this was like, well, I think this was first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. So each one of these pods became kind of a, a learning community or a neighborhood. And you can see kind of how that was set up. When you come in, there's kind of an open activity space and then all the classrooms kind of open off of that. There's a bathroom that serves those students. There's a teacher planning area right here. There's a resource classroom right here. So this becomes kind of a grade level neighborhood, if you will. Really, something that the people that went on the tour really thought was a very creative way, again, of breaking down the size of, our, of a, what is, would be considered a very large elementary school. This is the Oskaloosa plan, um, a much more compact plan. You'll see, instead of the wings, they have some courtyards here. Uh, and if you look at the plan, the reason, the primary reason for those courtyards is to get natural light into all of these classrooms. So it's a very compact plan, but it doesn't have the same feel that the, uh, that the Eudora plan has in terms of creating that separate identity and breaking the building down into smaller learning areas. Um, but it still worked very well. The thing that we really liked about this was the zoning. You can see the main entrance is here on, on either side of the activity area kind of separate, so during evening activities, these doors can be closed and close the academic area off from the activity area, which if we go back to the Eudora plan, the gym is kind of in the middle of the building. We didn't really like that compared to the way it works here at Oscar. <laughs> so part of the reason we wanted to do these tours was to be able to, for the, the, the planning team to kind of see experience how some other schools are, are able to do a, a large elementary school and yet they feel, still have the, the intimate feel that we want to have in an elementary school. So that was very helpful. Uh, I know there's a lot of numbers here and I'm just going to, basically what we've done here is we've looked at the, the three different options. So this option, number one, is fixing all the existing elementary schools and then adding the space to them. So here's that 128,000 square feet of existing building space that we have with your four existing elementary schools. And then this is including the proposed addition. So we need about a 70, total of about 70,000 square feet of additional space. Now the reason that number is so big is that we have a lot of duplication because not only are we adding a, a new multi-purpose space at Paddock, but we're adding one at Cedar, and we're adding one at Stoddard, and we're adding one at uh, Lincoln. Uh, so we end up with a lot of duplication of space in this scenario because we have four of everything. Does that make sense? So as we look at option two then, where we have Lincoln <coughs> Elementary as a preschool building and then a new K-5 building and it's off the page down here. But I believe that number is about 37,000 square feet, I believe, is what the number is. I can't see it. But you can see by having fewer buildings, we have, we have less duplication of space. Okay? So even though we're building one new building and we're using one existing building, the total square footage that we, we need to meet all the program needs is less than it is if we have it broken up into four separate buildings. Does that make sense? 36,000 square feet of new space or of additional space. And 
then option three, I think he's going up to try and fix that for us. Um, here we go. Anyway, the, the, the amount of new space or additional <laughs> space that we would have in this scenario is about 20,000 square feet. So when we look at that, in addition to the 128,000 we currently have, a new building would only be another 20,000 square feet. So there's the existing, our new building would be proposed at about 148,000 square feet. So you can see, just by looking at these three different options, that you can function much more efficiently in one building in terms of the amount of square feet you need to offer all the programs that you can need because we don't have a duplication of separate buildings. This is the proposed site. Again, it's right across the road here from the high school. I just wanted to share with you a little bit kind of what the master plan might look like. And again, this is still all very preliminary. But uh, a couple of the features that we have right now, there's the, the trail that kind of comes along the west side of the, of, the, of the site here. It connects to the trail that comes on across here somewhere. I'm not exactly in the route. But that's something we need to be aware of. Um, we have really three primary points of access. One would be uh, off of the main entrance to the high school There's with the light located here. So um, coming in there, there's a, 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 an access point off of Lincoln on the north and then off of 33rd on the east. So we have three primary points of access to our site. In addition to that, we've kind of looked at this corner of the site and saying, you know, it's kind of a, a, a narrow little knob on the corner here. Probably not something that we could use as part of the school, but maybe that could be uh, used as some kind of future retail. It could be sold off uh, for retail development of some kind. Um, this site is also master planned to accommodate a future middle school, so we would see the middle school being more on the south side of the site, closer to the high school, and probably more likely to have teachers that would be going back and forth between the middle school and the high school, uh, and keeping the elementary kids further away from the high school. So the elementary school would be then more on the north end of the site here. We have kind of a shared bus drop-off and pickup located kind of between the buildings with separate parent drop-off and pick-up for the middle school located here, and then parent drop-off. One of the things, if you remember on the Oskaloosa plan, if you saw it, they have kind of a double loop drop-off. That was really cool, it really works well, so we're proposing that similar kind of a configuration for, for the middle elementary school. Um, and then there'd be some parking associated with the elementary and the middle school. And then activity areas for um, middle school uh, programs here in the elementary play area, as well as then some designated kind of lower elementary and upper elementary uh, play areas around that building. So again, this is just kind of a real conceptual view of that property and how, if it's going to be master plan for middle school and high school, or middle school and elementary, how those could all fit on the site. I just want to talk a little bit about cost real quick. Um, understanding that there are three main components to the cost of any project. The first being, what is the size of the project? Or what is the scope, in, like the renovation projects, what is the scope of renovation that we have for a particular building? Or how big is the, the building addition? Or how big is the new building? The second part that we can control is the quality of the building. What are we building it out of? Is it masonry? Is it precast? Is it metal, steel? What is the building quality? What is the components of the building that we're going to build it out of? And then the third factor is the market factors. And we can't really control this. We just have to react to it. And that's where our partners from Samson and Casper's come into play in terms of understanding what is the cost of construction today and how that is going to apply to whether it's a renovation or a new building. So those three factors end up creating then what the total project cost will be. 
This is a renovation summary I mentioned before that we've got a pretty detailed list. We sat down with Terry Rethau and went through this in, in some detail and we're going to continue to refine it. But this is for Paddock Lane. So this just details all the different things that we will do in each of the buildings to renovate those buildings. So we have a pretty detailed understanding of what the scope of the work is to renovate and bring those buildings up to the same level in terms of quality to be comparable to a new building. So things like um, you know, replacing the mechanical <coughs> system or replacing the front doors, um, you know, roofing is a, is a big one. Uh, mechanical and electrical are the two biggest items on the list. If you, if you look over here on the side, you can see for the mechanical division, we've got about a million dollars of work just to update the mechanical system in Paddock Lane. Electrical, about a quarter of a million dollars. So, you know, those all add up pretty quickly when we start putting those together. But we want to show that we put some thought into determining what the costs are of fixing your existing building so that we can answer that question very definitively. The other part of this, obviously, as we look at cost, is there's a first cost of the cost of the renovation or construction, but there's an ongoing cost. One of the, the motivating factors of having a central elementary school is that it's just much more efficient to operate. As you, as you saw from the example, a new building is about 148,000 square feet, whereas if we add on and remodel your existing buildings, we've got about 198,000 square feet that we have to heat, we have to cool, we have to run the lights, we have to maintain. And so from a cost of operation standpoint, a single building uh, is going to be much more efficient to operate. It also, that same efficiency comes back to staff, not having to have staff travel, so that you can have more time spent with kids rather than traveling from one building to the next. Just to give you a, a quick overview, and I won't get into a lot of detail here, but the other factor that comes into play is what does this do, what does this mean in terms of uh, of our tax impact, tax revenue? <laughs> Ultimately, with school districts, any capital improvements is going to come back to a, a vote of the people, and it's going to have an impact on your taxes. Just to give you an idea, again, state statute requires that the state that the school districts cannot exceed a dollar five in their general building or general operating fund. Right now, the school district is at about a dollar three. And then with a building fund levy of about two cents. So if you add those two up, they equal real close to a dollar five. Okay? By state statute, you cannot exceed that. This building fund levy is basically your maintenance fund for your schools. So if there's a problem with a boiler or a roof, the only way you're going to pay for that is with this levy right here or through a bond issue, which has to be approved by the vote of the people. You do have an existing bond fund for your high school, which back in 1996, is that right? 96? That was a 17 cent increase in 1996. Okay? Because of valuation increases, that levy now is a dollar seven. So as your as your valuation has gone up, the levy's come down. Now there's also been some refinancing as you've gotten better interest rates been able to pay that off sooner and reduce that levy. Um, so right now, the current levy for the high school bond is, is seven cents, and that levy will be paid off next year. So the mortgage on your high school will be paid off in a year. Um, there's also what's called a capital uh, qualified capital purpose undertaking fund, which is another way that school districts can do things like asbestos abatement, air quality improvements, uh, any kind of hazardous material, um, things like that, kind of short-term improvements. Uh, right now, the district does have about a 2.7 cent levy um, under qualified capital purposes. <coughs> and then there's also a, a technology bond of about a penny. So your total levy in your district right now is $1.16. <coughs> Just to give you an example, I live in the Gretna School District Right now, I think our levy is about $1.38. But they're building a lot of new schools because it's growing like crazy. So in your growing districts where they have a lot of new facilities,
facilities, you can see the levy is much higher. Uh, but again, just want to give you a kind of a benchmark of where you are at in terms of your levy in your school district. This is your levy or your valuation back in 1996 was about $443 million. And that was what? Almost 20 years ago. So in 20 years, or in 19 years, that valuation has grown to over a billion dollars. Now, about 30% of your valuation is ag land, just as a kind of a note. So in that 19 years, that valuation has grown by 132%, so just under 7% annual growth in terms of tax valuation of the property within the Beatrice School District. So that's really, I won't get into the rest of this. There, there's other factors when it comes to determining the final cost in terms of tax levy with tax rate or credit rating and what are the interest rates and how long is the bond issue term. But again, just keep in mind that the, the high school bond will be paid off next year. So this is just an example. To kind of give you a, for example, for, for instance, you know, different bond amounts and then terms. So if you go 15 year term, 20, 25, 30. So this is, if we take this one, for example, $25 million bond issue would be about 18 cents of levy increase. So, uh, well, I guess the example I used down here was 30 million at 3.5 for 20 years. So that'd be this 21.5 cents. So for a property assessed at $100,000, that would be an additional property tax of $215 per year of increase, just to give you, again, an example. Now, keep in mind, in, in a year, seven cents is going to come off of what you're currently paying. So if, if, the, if the bond issue were to pass, say, in the next year, the net increase, if you use this example right here, would be about a 14 cent increase, because you'd be dropping seven and going up 21. So it'd be a net increase of 14 cents. Does that make sense? So, so what's next? Um, right now, the board, we, we gave a presentation to the school board last week, kind of a, a more detailed summary of what you've heard here today. Um, so they're going to be in the process of calling a citizens committee together. Um, we're going to review all the findings that we've, again, in more detail than what you've heard here today. We want to share all the information that we've gathered with the community and then review the pros and cons of the different options and then ultimately make a recommendation to the school board for consideration for a bond issue. So um, there's going to be some meetings coming up. We haven't set the dates for these specifically, but what we're thinking is we'll have a meeting in each of the elementary schools and cover specific topics. Uh, these will probably be on about a two-week cycle over the next month and a half to two months um, so that we can again share all this information with your community. We want to encourage all of you, if you want to participate or if you know somebody that would be good to participate in this, encourage them to, to, to be a part of this. Uh, the hardest part of this is getting information to people and getting accurate information to people. And with, we want to encourage you to again to ask questions. So that's all I have and I apologize Dr. Merritt for going long. I know you guys have some work to do yet today, so I appreciate your attention. Again, if you have questions, I'd be glad to try and answer those now. Or if you want to email those to Dr. Merritt, as you think about it some more, we'll try to get answers to you. So again, thank you. If you hear questions or you have questions, we want to be able to answer them, so make sure you get those to us. Anything you'd like to add? Are there any questions right now? you'd like to just ask after hearing the presentation. Did that good, huh? You just want to get out of here. I just want to thank you again. Yep. Oh. Question. Okay, yeah. Uh, would there be staff reductions or maintenance <coughs> reductions as far as staff? Currently, the board isn't looking at making any adjustments in staffing at this time. The issue was when we looked at moving to a single site elementary, we do think over time there might be some efficiencies we can look at, uh, but the rationale and reason to go to that at this time was not to look at staff reductions. Would that include 
uh, paras and uh, maintenance people like janitors, custodians? I think at this time, uh, at least from what I've heard from the staff when I came, or I'm sorry, from the board when I came, is uh, you know while there might be some efficiencies they would look at, so let's just say we had a para, a para retire at the end of the year, this when right before the building came online, we probably would look at that and say, is there a need to replace that? But uh, it wasn't an item where they looked at uh, when that happens, we're going to start to make reductions to staff. Keep, keep in mind that if the board were to decide to, to go forward with a bond issue, say in the next two months, you're not going to see a building for at least two years, maybe three. So this is a solution that's going to take some time. We, we still need to keep our existing buildings and keep the operations in place that we currently have. So and we don't know that it's going to be a new building either. That's, again, that's kind of the direction that the strategic plan is established. But the ultimate decision is going to be with the people of the address. So again, I, this isn't about what I want or what Pat wants. It's about what your community wants. So that's what we want to get to. Yeah. Any ideas on what you're going to, how you're going to dispose of those buildings? And what you're going to do? That that's one of the top four questions that we still are working on. I think that uh, I don't know, Pat, you want me to address that? You can. I've got a Okay. Um, you know, with one option, obviously we were looking at maybe using one of the existing buildings. I think the other option would be, you know, you've got some of those, some of your existing buildings that are in neighborhoods that would probably uh, make good. Redevelopment for housing. There may be other options, you know, to sell those buildings off for appropriate use. But certainly, the last thing the school district wants to do is have a building sit there that's empty. So, in terms of the costs that we've included, we would include any cost of, of demolition of any building that was not that did not have a reasonable repurposing. And just to add to that, I think uh, Beatrice itself is very sensitive to the fact of old buildings sitting there and. Not being used. So, one of the issues we looked at, as Pat said, is what it would take to demo those buildings and then utilize that land for different purposes, whether it be to sell for construction or to, to work with the green space, work with the city on that. Uh, but we know we have to have that there. It has to be a good answer to that question for the community. They deserve that. one of the elementary buildings that are coming up in the next few weeks, are those more informational meetings like what we have seen here? Or is there, well, is there a plan for a promotional uh, push on this for the city? I know in 1996, it was the fourth bond issue that passed. 